So how about it, guys? Smash that like button, hit the subscribe, and stay with me for this awesome cross-cut sled build that's got an added feature that you don't want to miss. Stay with me. It's right here. <laughs> Like any good tool, as I've said before, requires a good foundation. That's why I'm making mine as big as I am. I've had one bigger in the past, but it got to be a little cumbersome to move around the shop, so I sized it down. Since I like the size and shape of the other one, that's the one I'm going to mimic. So I first break down a 4x8 sheet of plywood on a set of sawhorses using my circular saw and a straight edge guide. I also score the cross grain to make sure that the splintering is kept down to a minimum. Once I'm done, I put up that sheet and keep the one that I cut off and cut it down to size on my table saw. Now I plan on using these solid aluminum 24 inch miter bars. The reason for that is because I've made wood runners in the past and due to expansion and contraction, even though I made them with quarter sawn oak, they still sometimes drag. This will eliminate that inconsistency. Plus, they have these adjustment screws that are made from nylon that you can adjust over the course of time if you find that your sled gets a little sloppy. If you can't afford something like this and you want to make some hardwood runners, I'll leave a link down in the description below of two videos, one of mine and one of a brilliant description from William Ng. I plan on installing these, however before I do I have a few more cuts that I need to make on the table saw. Installing these is going to require covering up my blade, so I'm going to have to continue on doing some other things before I do this. Now it's time to make the fence. I'm going to make it out of hardwood, which is ash. And I want the fence itself to be overall six inches tall. However, it will step down after a little bit and continue out at three inches. So I'm gonna rip this down to three inches and then laminate it together for the bottom part of the fence. And then I'm going to do the same for the top. Now these miter bars are milled to a certain specification. What I mean by that is, when they're placed inside the miter slot, they sit below the surface by the tiniest fraction of an inch. So in order to raise those up, I'm gonna stick some dimes, which are the thinnest of all the coins, because I don't need it raised up that much, right inside the miter slots and then put the bar right on top of those. This will make it sit proud of the table saw surface, so when I go to place the plywood on, that's all it will be touching and nothing else. Now because I know that my fence is perfectly parallel with my blade, I'm going to use it as an aid to help me set the plywood on the miter bars themselves. Now I don't want the blade to be exactly center of the sled because I want to be able to take care of any blind spots. If I have 18 inches on this side and 18 inches on this side, I don't have the versatility on left or right of the blade. So I'm going to off center it just a little bit so I can cover a certain amount here and a certain amount here. So I've set the fence up at 18 inches, which is off center from the 30 inch overall width of the sled. So I've taken the time to set the miter bars exactly flush to the back of the saw. Now I'm just going to apply some glue, set the plywood up against the fence, and then carefully lay it on top of the miter bars, making sure that it's flush with the back edges. Then just put something heavy down on it until the glue cures. All right, now that the glue is cured, we can take it out of the miter slots. Then countersink these holes just a little bit deeper so our screws can sit below the surface and it won't drag inside the miter slot. Now I plan on inserting some T-track inside the sled down the width of it to make it more versatile. I also plan on putting this in the fence, but we'll take care of that later. I've changed my blade out to the dado stack, and after running a few test cuts, I've got the depth, and the width set to where the T-Track sits just like a glove and is slightly lower than the surface of the sled so it does not catch. Now the design of my sled is not a traditional one. I'm going to have a stabilizer bar here in the front that's actually going to be laying horizontal. Uh, most of them are vertical. So in order for me to be able to get bolts into the T-Track, because the stabilizer bar is going to be covering up the end of the dado, I'm going to have to back set the T-Track about an inch and a half from the edge. Then, take a fine blade and score a mark where the track meets the sled. Then I'll be able to cut it at the miter saw. 
After running out of super glue, I realized that I had some DAP rapid fuse. It is, after all, cyanoacrylate glue, so I'll give it a try. Now the super glue is only temporary. I'm just going to secure it with a few screws. Once we are done with the joiner fence, we're just going to run them through the planer to clean them up. Now after cutting the fence to length on the table saw, I brought it over to the router using a chamfer bit and at the base of the fence I've created a dust channel. This will create a way for the dust to escape without causing inconsistencies when the stock meets the fence after cutting multiple pieces. Now with the help of some push blocks for some safety and my dado stack back in the table saw set 3 eighths of an inch deep, 3 quarters of an inch wide, I've created a channel in the very top of the fence that will allow a T-track to mount right there for some stop blocks that I can clamp down later. I'm also going to create a channel in the bottom portion of the fence for some more T-track on either side of the blade. Now if you remember from my previous sled, I actually had some curvatures around the front just to take off the blockiness uh, that this plywood stands as it is right now. And the easiest way to go about doing that for a simple pattern is take a quart sized paint can or stain can and use that as your pattern. I'm going to measure two inches from the side because I've got an inch overhang from the edge of the sled to the edge of the fence. It doesn't go all the way to the edge. Then I measure half the thickness of my fence from the edge of the uh, back of the sled. And that's three quarters of an inch is that halfway point. Then I draw a line across those two points and this will be my pivot point. That will come into play in the squaring up the fence. Now we're just going to go back up through that hole we made into the fence to pre-drill for a screw hole. Now we're just going to raise it up a little bit to pierce the bottom of the sled. We're going to use a framing square to help square up the blade as much as possible to make the uh, five cut method as easy as possible with minimal movement of the fence. Now the next step is to raise the blade back up through the sled and then run it through the fence. Now, first we're going to take our board and establish a baseline. We're going to make a series of five cuts to determine how far out of square our fence actually is. This will be cut one, two, three, four, and our fifth and final cut. We're then going to cut a thin strip off of this edge and measure the top and bottom ends to find out how far out of square we are. Then using William Ng's five cut equation, we'll apply all the math necessary to determine where we need to move our fence to get it just perfect. So now that we know those measurements, we're just going to subtract the top from the bottom. Then take that answer and divide it by four, which are the four cuts that we just did. Take that answer and divide it by the length of the piece that you cut off, which in our case was 12 and 7 eighths which is 12.875 when you divide it out. Take the answer from that and multiply it by the length of your fence from the pivot point to the end of the other end. And whatever you're left with is how far off out of square that your fence truly is. And in our case, it is 18.4 thousandths. We're just gonna call it 18 thousandths of an inch out of alignment. It's of an inch. When I did my calculations, the number that I came up with was a negative number. Because of that, it tells me that my fence needs to go forward. If I had a positive number, I would need to move it backward. Now, to begin, you're going to need to find the 18,000th shim, if this is your measurement. Slide it in between your piece that you cut a point on because you have, to, you have to have 18 thousandths to move forward. So you gotta put something in the way. So you just push it up to the 18 thousandths, kind of snug. But not now the original screw that we put in here, we're gonna take out. Now just scoot the fence forward into your point. 
Now because the hole that we made previously was set up for the old alignment, we definitely don't want to use it again because it will just pull the fence right back into place. So we need to make a new hole. Now, after checking my measurements on the top and bottom, I am off nine thousandths of an inch right now. I want to get it a little bit lower. So I'm going to attempt the method one more time. We'll see how good we get. So after taking another go at it, I managed to get it down to five thousandths of an inch. That's another four thousandths better than I had it before. I think I'm gonna call it good with that. The last sled that I made, I got down to two thousandths of an inch, and that may have just been dumb luck. Now, I've always had a few people ask me, why do I have so many drills? Well, they're handy. One to pre-drill, one to countersink, and the other one to drive in the screw. Beats changing bits every time. All right, now with the fence secured, all that's left is to put in the T-tracks on top and bottom. And then to add one more surprise, I'm not going to break that to you just yet. Now all I've done is I've raised the blade up to its max height and I've ran it through the fence. What that did is establish the kerf line that will allow me to cut the T-track just right to where I can get it as close as possible. So let's go ahead and cut those out. Now all I'm doing here is just chamfering the ends of the T-track to match the chamfers on the sled itself. This way, I don't catch them on anything. Now, when it comes to safety of crosscut sleds, you really want to have a blade guard on the back side. I've never put one on. So, I'm gonna do that this time. But I'm gonna add one cool thing to it. Yeah, it's a blade guard, but it's also dust collection. Now the one big thing that I absolutely despise about my old sled is all the dust that got shot back out of the kerf onto my shirt and also all the dust that would be created here on top of the sled just from taking a blade width off of a piece of wood. Now in combination with my big dust collection and this dust collector this thing has no dust on it whatsoever after two cuts of less than a blade width and a blade width off of this one piece of pine. It is excellent! I didn't know it was going to work this well, but I am super ecstatic with having dust collection port right on my crosscut sled. So guys, thank you very much for sticking with me through this long process. It has been a pleasure getting to share this with you, and I cannot wait to make a few more things that is going to be part of this sled. All of the jigs that I've made in the past are now going to be all combined into one. So stick around for the build process that will continue on this sled. You're gonna love it. Thank you guys very much. I will talk to you next time. Be sure and smash that like button, hit the subscribe if you haven't done it yet, and I will see you on the next build. One, two, three, boom!